بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. I always love to start off talks with a story, simply because I've seen it work. So, a few years ago, I was working in High Wycombe, which is a, a little town city outside London. And back in those days, we didn't have internet on our phones, so what we had to do was use something known as internet cafes, which I'm pretty sure you guys have no idea what those are. So those were cafes where you went in, you used to, you know, you could buy video games, drinks and stuff, and you, you could also use the internet. So I went there to go check my emails, and after work, I used to regularly go to the internet cafe, and in the internet cafe, there was a non-Muslim guy who I used to regularly interact with, and one day, I decided, okay, so, got a bit of an opportunity here, let me ask him about Islam, let me try and give him some doubt. So, when I came, after using the internet, went, to, went up to him, I don't remember exactly the, uh, the steps I took, but, you know, I think I paid, and I, then I said to him, you know, um, do you believe in God? And he gave me this look, this very strange look. It's not the kind of look which is like a, a deer in headlights, like scared, but this type of certainty, this type of, you know, it's almost like a biblical uh, Bible basher, like this, 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 this somebody who, who has something to say. And he looked at me and he said, I believe in science. Now I was taken back by this because I thought, you believe in science? Well, okay, I believe in science too. The kangaroo believes in science. What does, it, what does it mean? Then I started thinking, actually, he didn't answer my question. I asked him, do you believe in God? And he said, I believe in science. So he actually, it was like two cars going past each other. He didn't actually answer my question. So I was thinking, that was a bit of a weird answer. And I kept thinking about that. And then I thought, actually, no. No, 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 no. He did answer my question. God is something we worship, something we believe in, something we put our trust in, something we put our hope in, something that we realize is the highest ideal, the perfect being. And when he said, I believe in science, he was answering my question. Because he did believe in science. And he has made science into a God. Science into a religion and science into something which is great. We say Allahu Akbar, they say science Hu Akbar. I'm not kidding. They have this belief. And what's really interesting is sometimes pointing out historical um, aspects of science is a very powerful way of pulling under the rug of people who make those sort of claims. Now, before I get into how we could actually do that, I just want you to consider something. Does anyone on this earth worship Uzza? Firstly, who's heard of Uzza? What about Manat? Or Lat? What are these? Come on, Aziz, give me some answers. Idols. They're idols. What do you do with idols? You worship them, you believe in them, you put your trust in them. So the idol of this age is no longer a little structure made out of stones or dates. The idol has become the universe itself. So atheists today, the militant atheists like the one I described earlier, they do believe in an idol. They do believe in an Uzzah and Allah and a Manat. And they are mushriks in the sense that they believe there is something other than Allah which has the power to create, which has the power to inspire, which has the power to fulfill our desires. And it is the idol of the universe. The universe has created us. The universe is a genius. It's mother nature. They give all these sort of terms for it. And what's really powerful when you think about the early scientists and what's important about science is this. The father of modern science is not Galileo, not Kepler, not Francis Bacon, 
the father of the scientific method itself is Hassan ibn Haytham. Yeah, it sounds like somebody you, you know, it comes up on TV. Hassan ibn Haytham, you know, did something on whatever, right? But it was Hassan ibn Haytham. And who was Hassan ibn Haytham? Hassan ibn Haytham was a Quranic scholar. He was somebody who believed that science is going to bring him closer to Allah. He is somebody who lived approximately a thousand years ago. And what did he do? He came up with a method which we use till this day, the inductive scientific method. He took on the early method of the Greeks, which was proto-science. It wasn't exactly science, it was proto-science. And he put falsification in there. He put testing in there. He put experimentation in there. And this is attested to by non-Muslim historians. Although, very few actually admit this. Because when they want to talk about the father of modern science, it sounds a lot better if the surname is Bacon rather than Ibn Haytham. Would no, this is actually true. Which is why, if you look it up, even on such an amazingly neutral website as Wikipedia, put in the scientific method, and reluctantly they have to put Hassan Ibn Haytham there, and reluctantly, chronologically, they're forced to put him above Francis Bacon. Why? Because Francis Bacon was inspired by him. Roger Bacon actually wrote a summary of Ibn Haytham's works, and that was Latinized, that was sorry, translated, and that was spread all over Europe. And he came much, much later. So, when someone says, I believe in science, and they're trying to put it forward as something amazing which has been discovered other than Allah, we can actually pull the rug under them and say, actually, it was the Muslims who came up with science. Uh, the modern scientific method. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about something in regards to doubts. Doubts that people have about the existence of God, or doubts that people have about something in the Qur'an which may contradict science. There's some really interesting studies that have, done, that have been done, and these interesting studies are about how people react when other people see them, or sorry, when other people are around them. So they did this famous experiment in which they had these lines on this board, and some of the lines were shorter than others. And there was like six people in the room, and this was like the 1960s, something like this, and some of the people in the room, they had those funky hairstyles like the Beatles and flares and stuff. You could tell that they were quite old. And in that, one of them was the test, and the rest of them were actors. And they were asked, which line is the shortest? Now there's clearly, amongst those four or five lines on the board, one which was the shortest. But then there was one which was slightly longer. So they asked, in order, all of the actors who were there. And the test subject, he's a guinea pig, he doesn't know what's going on. So they ask, which is the shortest line? The first one, he gives the wrong answer. The second one, he gives the wrong answer. But they say B, say they say the letter B, although it's C which is the smallest. You can visually see, C is the smallest line. The next one says the same thing. The next one says the same thing. The next one says the same thing. They're all actors, so they're lying. They're pretending as if that's the shortest line. And the guy who is a test subject, the guinea pig, he's there. They ask him. He can clearly see that one of the lines is the shortest, but because of social pressure, he says D. He says the wrong answer. Human beings will deny their own perception to fit in line with society. That's what human beings are like. Human beings are sheep. Another study that was done on sheep. If 5% of sheep, I don't remember the exact percentage, but if, I remember it's something like 5% of sheep went in one direction, the rest of the sheep followed them without knowing where they were going. And then they decided to test Homo sapiens, us. And the percentage was exactly the same. Even happened to me this morning. Me and Islamuddin, who was here earlier, we were walking up the street, leaving the Ibis Hotel, and we were coming to the conference. And as we were walking, I said, Islamuddin, do you know where you're going? He's like, no, I was following you. And we were just walking up the street. 
human beings do this. But the Quranic paradigm is not follow your society, follow your forefathers, follow your desires, follow what other people are saying. The Quranic paradigm is use your reason, use your intelligence. I am telling you this because there's people out there, they, not because I'm someone special, I, mean, I, I just happen to have a beard, it grows quite fast because I'm Pakistani. So, because of this, people think, oh, this guy has some knowledge, so let me, let me, let me message him. So this one guy, just going to tell you about doubts, this one guy he contacted me. And he said, oh, bro, I'm having doubts, my iman's on the floor, please help me out. I was like, okay. And he's, you know, he, he WhatsApp to me, and he, he was one of those brothers, he looks like those, you know, those guys that have, the Instagram beard guys, like he's got a beard that looks like it's, it's, it, it was carved or chiseled. <laughs> And this guy, I said to him, okay, what's the problem, Ahi? He said, um, I read this article and uh, my iman's on the floor and blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, okay, fine, fine. So we were WhatsApping each other. And he said, uh, okay, it's this, this particular article from Stanford uh, University and it's, it's this particular thing about God and whatnot. So I opened it up. And Alhamdulillah, not because I'm into good or, you know, I don't have any special abilities or whatever, but Alhamdulillah, I do understand philosophy because I study at uh, postgraduate level. So I was reading through this article, and I thought to myself, I don't understand what this article says. And the way philosophy works, anyone who studies philosophy is, you don't just read it once. You read it, you read the introduction, then you read the end, then you read it again, and then you have a cup of coffee, and then you smash it against the wall because you don't understand it, and then you try again the next day. That's the way philosophy works. It's very difficult to understand. So I was thinking to myself, myself this guy, he doesn't look like the sort of person who understands this thing. Because I don't understand it, and I study philosophy at postgraduate level, and he looks like a 19-year-old. Okay, so I said to him, Ahi, did you read the article? Uh, I, I was just going, did you read the article? Uh, no. So why are you having doubts? Well, when I was going through the article, there's all this writing and all these premises. And I said to him, you're having doubts about something you don't even understand? Because there's a lot of writing. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's all right now, it's all right. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is a real case scenario. Allah's my witness. He was having doubts because he thought he was supposed to have doubts. Social conformity. Sheikh Wajid Tareen just told us a really funny thing. You know, I, uh, you know, there's like a koala, koala bear, whatever you guys call, right? So this koala, say it falls down from a tree. The other koala falls down. They ask, why did you fall down? My tail was tied to the other one. The third koala fall, falls. Why did you fall down? They fell, so I fell. Human beings are social beings and we're affected by society. In today's society of scientific rationalism, we are given a worldview and people accept it completely without actually even thinking. They don't think about the limits of science. They don't think about the question of God. They don't think about things like evolutionary theory. They simply start to have doubts or they are firm about something because other people are convinced. That is it. We are like sheep. But Islam teaches you not to be a sheep. Islam teaches you, you have to think for yourself even if you're the only person in the world. Why do we, in our religion, Honor Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam went against all of society. All of society was saying something and he said, no, this is wrong. And his descendant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the same. Everybody was doing shirk. He's like, shirk is haram. Shirk is wrong. So if you want to be a Muslim, you need to understand, you have to accept the Quranic paradigm. Sorry, you can no longer be a sheep. Sorry, you can be no longer somebody in which somebody who is phased by smoke and mirrors. When the Sahaba, they saw, they were surrounded at the Battle of the Trench by an enemy force. An enemy force which was large, which was the largest in Arabia, 10,000 strong. And they were stuck in Medina, a few of them. Some of them, their swords were so brittle that they didn't even have handles, they used to wrap cloth 
to hold the sword. And they were fighting against who? 10,000 strong. And they had their women and their children and everybody in the city. And imagine that yourself. Imagine your family is stuck in a city and when the invading force comes in, the men are going to get killed and everybody knows what's going to happen to the women and children. Imagine the fear. And what happened? The monarchs, the hypocrites, they saw this army and they saw what the, what the Prophet of Allah said. He said, you will be victorious. He said, you will be victorious. And not only will you be victorious, you will conquer Rome, you will conquer Persia, you will conquer Yemen, and Islam will dominate the world. That's what he said. And they were stuck in a little place. What did the Munafiq say? He, he, that man, he talks about victory. And we can't go to the toilet without having arrows shot at us. He talks about victory, but his religion and their religion has deluded them. They even stopped calling Medina Medina and they started calling it Yathrib. They saw with their eyes an army like they've never seen before. And they saw the promise of Allah's Messenger. And they chose that which they saw above what Allah's Messenger said. And the Sahaba, the believers, what did they do? They saw with their own eyes what the Munafiq saw, what the hypocrites saw. They saw the largest army in Arabia around them. And they heard with their own ears what Muhammad said. So now they're going through the same test. And the test is, will they choose the words of Muhammad وسلم, or will they choose what their eyes are showing them? And they said, and Allah recorded it in the Quran, this is what Allah and His Messenger has promised, and Allah and His Messenger has spoken the truth. And what happened? Not only was that army defeated, Persia was defeated, Rome was defeated, Yemen was defeated, and Islam spread to the entire world. Why? Because they decided to choose the words of Muhammad Sallallahu above what their eyes could see. And today, it's the same issue. The Qur'an is telling us something. And there are people who have belief in the Qur'an because of its miracles, because of its connection with Allah. And they decide to choose what the Qur'an says above what philosophers say when they can't even back, clean their backside properly. I'm being honest with you. You have to make a choice between what Allah's Messenger has said and what other people may say. And you will, and I promise you this, you will, if you put your trust in Allah, you will see their deception being unraveled. They may come to you and say evolution is a fact. Darwinian evolution is a fact. Human beings and chimpanzees have a common ancestor. There is no God. There is no this. There is no that. You may not know the answers at that point. But I promise you by Allah, if you put your trust in Allah, you will see their deception. And this isn't just me saying this. This is the promise of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, whose word is truer than Allah? Sometimes when there's a conflict between two friends and you are there, you know one friend's trustworthy, you know the other one's a bit trustworthy but a bit shady. You go with the trustworthy one. In life, you have to make a choice. Which is the highest ideal? Which is the highest epistemology, the highest root of knowledge? Who knows better than Allah? No one knows better than Allah. First, what we have to do is we have to understand this is the truth. And once we understand this is the truth, then Allah will open for us all types of knowledge. Now, that man in the beginning when he said, I believe in science, they made science into a religion, into a methodology. Let's look at some basic things. So this Shayateen al ins who was here before, on the screen, because we know the Shayateen of the Jinn and the Shayateen al ins Now this Shayateen al ins this Richard Dawkins, what did he say? He said in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, Darwin allowed us to be intellectually satisfied atheists. That's what he said. Darwin allowed us to become intellectually satisfied atheists. Many people will look at that statement and they'll look at the fact that the majority of the world, uh, in terms of the Western world, they say that this theory is a fact. And then automatically they will say, oh, I don't believe in God anymore because evolution undermines God and um, evolution accepted by everyone. But I, like I told you, 
Just like the Sahaba and the Munafiks, they saw finally when the battle ended that the words of Allah's Messenger were true and this deception was cleared for them. Likewise, when you go and study for the sake of Allah and you know that Islam is the truth, Allah will show you. Charles Darwin himself, what did he say? He said, in my wildest fluctuations, my wildest fluctuations, I was never an atheist. So Richard Dawkins is telling you something, Charles Darwin is telling you something else. In fact, I want you to consider something. When you have people like him saying, in his book, The God Delusion, it, the central argument of God Delusion is what? Darwinian evolution is true, it undermines God, and likewise, physics will also one day show us a type of Darwinism, therefore God doesn't exist. What does Charles Darwin himself say? Charles Darwin himself, in the second edition of The Origin of Species, he includes a quote of another theist who says, whether God created all species individually or God created all species through one original species, which is the Darwinian theory, either way, this is a noble thing for God to do. Charles Darwin was so impressed by those words, he put them in his second edition of the origin of species. You will see a massive difference between the truth and the falsehood. You will see a massive difference between the public perception of science and philosophy and uh, evolutionary theory and the academic. There is a big difference. So when people say, I believe in science, I only believe in proof, I only believe in that which I can see, let's ask them some questions. For example, does Kangis Khan exist? Think about that. Kenghis Khan, the man who had an empire, whose grandchildren invaded Baghdad, the people who turned the world over. Can you know by the scientific method that Kenghis Khan existed? Can you go to his grave? No one knows where his grave is. Can you study his DNA? No, you can't. Can you go back and take a picture of him? No, you can't. How do you know he existed? because of testimony of other human beings who lived at the time and told their children and told their children and told their children. Science is based on testimony. Majority of human knowledge is based on testimony. That doesn't mean you just blindly accept any testimony, but there is a science of testimony itself. There is a methodology of testimony itself. Or if I was to ask you, does the country of Madagascar exist? I had somebody saying to me the other day, I only believe in science and logic. I said, do you believe in Madagascar? And he said, yeah. I said, fine. Show to me using science that Madagascar exists. We have a map. That's what somebody wrote on a map. We have a picture. That's what somebody said. Again, it's testimony. Think about mathematics or logic, logical rules. Science is based on mathematics and logical rules. You cannot prove a formula and algebra using science. Science presupposes maths and logic. Lastly, morals. People say, oh, I only believe in science. Do you believe a little small child that's going across the road is deliberately run over by a car? Do you believe that's wrong? Yeah, I believe it's wrong. Does that make you angry? Yes, it makes me angry. Right. Let's measure that scientifically. Let's come up with a philosophical argument for morality. There is no philosophical argument that proves objective morals exist. Morality is a real thing. There is no scientific experiments to measure morality. Yet, morals is what drives human beings. Emotions is what drives human beings when they see injustice in the world. The main thing which drives human beings, you cannot scientifically verify. So this whole idea of we believe in science and science can pay our taxes and science can do this and science can do that is completely false. Science is a beautiful method, which was invented, the method itself, by the Muslims to get closer to Allah. It is a beautiful method which changes, which, whose conclusions can change. We don't make it into a religion in of itself. Likewise, scientists, they look at conclusions, they, they come up with conclusions based upon a limited set of observations. You can always get a new observation which will challenge your previous conclusion. So for example, people used to believe in white swans, that all swans are white because 
they used to see white swans. So they used to say all swans are white. One day they came across black swans, therefore that theory was wrong. The other issue in science, and the issue which I just mentioned is known as the problem of induction, this is an ancient problem, is underdetermination of scientific theory. Very long word, but what it basically means is this. The same observations can give rise to alternative theories. Obviously scientists have to decide one theory, but they can give rise to alternative theories. Now, I want you to consider something else that this Richard Dawkins says. He says, today the theory of evolution is as much open to doubt as the theory that the earth goes around the sun. Imagine that. Okay. If what he's saying is correct, why is it in 2016, in the Royal Society in London, which is the most prestigious scientific institution in the world and the oldest, why did evolutionary biologists from across the world come together and debate and discuss and disagree about the very core mechanism of Darwin's theory, which is natural selection? Why is it that if what he said is correct, in 2016, you had non-theist, atheist scientists from across the world that came to discuss the question, is Darwin's theory even correct in the first place? Some of them were saying yes, the majority were saying, sorry, the majority were saying yes, and minority were saying no, they were disagreeing with each other. If what he said is correct, obviously it is not. And that brings up another question. Remember, the shaitan's trick is to mix truth with falsehood. Mix a bit of truth with a bit of falsehood. So is evolution a fact? Is evolution true? The answer simply is yes, it is true. And it was known to be true before Darwin. It was known to be true amongst the Muslim scientists before. It was known as far back as almost 3,000 years ago with Hindu philosophers coming up with evolutionary theories. What does evolution mean? Evolution simply means biological change over time. That's what it means. Trivial, simple answer. Darwinian evolution is something different, which is why it's called Darwinian evolution. And look at the fact that majority of people in the world, they don't even know the difference between evolution and Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution is a particular idea. And the particular idea is all of life, human beings, cells, grass, leaves, everything in nature, including mosquitoes and kangaroos, come from a common ancestor. Very simple idea. And this comes out like a tree, a tree of life. Second, there is the idea that evolution by natural selection is the driving force of this tree. So these two ideas are connected. It's like a bridge. You have the supports and you have the road. The road is the trajectory of the tree of life, or the trajectory between a bacteria evolving over millions of years into a multicellular large creature. And the structure is the mechanism. If the mechanism breaks, the structure breaks. So if somebody is challenging natural selection as a mechanism, they're also challenging the very structure. Now some of you may have no clue to what I just said. But I just want you to remember one thing. You haven't been told the entire story. Just keep that in mind. The very fact that all you've been taught in your life is evolution and not the difference between evolution and Darwinian evolution and not even the fact that there are people who disagree about it should go to show how far the propaganda has actually gone. There's three things about Darwinian evolution, which no scientist in the world can deny. Somebody can come up to you and say, how stupid are you? You don't believe in Darwinian evolution. 99.9% .9 of scientists believe in Darwinian evolution. You can tell them, no problem. Those 99.9% .9 of biologists who believe in Darwinian evolution, isn't it true that they believe it's based on a probabilistic framework? Isn't it true that they believe it has assumptions? Isn't it true there are still disputes about its core ideas amongst evolutionary biologists? 
three things I said. Probabilistic framework, assumptions, disputes. These three things are something no evolutionary biologist in the world can deny. Apart from that, there are some evolutionary biologists who put together complete alternatives to Darwin's theory, like evolution by natural genetic engineering, neo-Lamarckian evolution, or evolution uh, Mendelian mutationism. Complete alternatives. The public has never heard of them. Why? Because there's an image that they want to project. And the image they want to project is, this thing is true, don't challenge it. If you challenge it, you're a caveman. I want you to consider something. Julian Huxley, he was an evolutionary biologist in the beginning of the 20th century. He was an atheist, a militant atheist at that, and a philosopher. He believed Darwinian evolution is a religion. And he believed that this new religion must be propagated to the world. And he wrote a book called Religion Without Revelation. Which is that religion without revelation? It was evolutionary humanism. And he believed that the world should be indoctrinated in this religion. And he was the first president of the United Nations Scientific, Cultural and Educational Organization, UNESCO. This isn't some guy working in his mom's basement. This is the first president in the middle of the 20th century of the United Nations Scientific, Cultural and Educational Organization. Meaning, he had direct influence on global education. And we today have been impacted by his teachings. What he wanted to do, he has managed to do. Which is to create this impression that this theory is true. And to, as in his words, he wanted to get rid of religion like Christianity and Islam and replace it with a new religion. What's interesting is in academic circles, even atheist philosophers and scientists have realized Darwin's theory is more than just a scientific theory. It is a worldview. For example, the atheist philosopher, Michael Roos, who published a book recently with Oxford University. The book is called Darwinism as Religion. In this book, he says, Darwin's theory is a valid scientific theory. However, apart from being a valid scientific theory, it was from the very beginning, and it is today, a religion, a secular religious perspective, an alternative to Christianity and conventional religions. In academic circles, it is understood that this is not just a scientific theory. And in academic circles, if anybody studies within academia, they will know about the massive difference between the public understanding and the academic understanding. Just imagine one thing. We see these documentaries in which it says, look at this thing, look at this thing. They're similar, so they must have a common ancestor. In academia, you will not find a single philosopher, a single philosopher of biology saying the same thing. Because they know similarities due to common ancestry is an assumption. To make it a conclusion is circular reasoning. Plus on top of that, we know of multiple similarities in nature, identical at the biochemical level, at the genetic level, at the anatomical level, at the psychological level, at the linguistic level, at a biogeographical level, which are not due to common ancestry. They are not at all. That's what the public doesn't actually know. To end this talk, I want to speak about the future. Allah says in the Quran, O oh, you who believe, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger to that which gives you life. As much as the atheist movement tries to create an impression that there is no God, 
that science has disproven God, that evolution challenges revelation. As much as it does that, it cannot explain the human being. It cannot explain what human beings do. It cannot connect with human beings. What is Tawheed? Tawheed is like a human being. If you imagine a human being being a circuit which is broken and it's connected and there's electricity which goes around. That is what happens when Tawheed enters the heart of a human being. And there's no way that an atheist evolutionary biologist or a psychologist or a philosopher can create that same impact with human beings. Which is why from day one, from the time that Muhammad started his preaching till today, Islam is growing, Islam is extending and Islam is expanding. Although there may be amongst, those, amongst us those Muslims who fall off, who get confused. Just remember one thing, Allah says in the Quran, if, oh you who believe, if you turn away from your religion, Allah will replace you by people who love Him and they love Allah. So don't think you will do any harm or somebody will do any harm to Al-Islam by falling off. All you will do is create a situation in which Allah will guide someone else. Because for everyone that's lost, there's a new one gained. In fact, if you look at the studies of the Muslim community in America, recently there was a study published by Pew, a research tank, which said this percentage of Muslims have apostated and left Islam. Which is something which is very much celebrated by atheists because it makes them feel better. But in the same study, it said the exact same amount has converted to Islam. Allah Akbar. Allah's promise is true. If you turn away from Allah's deen, He will replace you with someone else. Islam is a religion which we, whether we understand certain aspects of it or we do not understand certain aspects of it, the promise of Allah will come true. Allah says in the Quran, It is He who has sent His Messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that He may cause it to prevail over all religion. And enough is Allah as a witness. And Allah repeats the same promise in the Quran. It is He who sent His Messenger with guidance in the religion of truth, so that He may cause it to prevail over all religion, even though the disbelievers hate it. And Allah makes the promise again in the Quran. It is He who sent His Messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, so that it may prevail over all religion, even though the mushriks, those who associate with Allah, hate it. So, Islam intellectually will dominate. It will dominate Christianity, Judaism, Taoism, Shintoism, Lady Gaga, whatever it is. Islam will prevail intellectually. Why? Because it's the truth. What does Allah say? There's no match between truth and guesswork. There's no match between truth and falsehood. The truth is with Islam, the truth is Islam because it's been sent by the one who is Al-Haq, the truth. Everything I've said is from Allah, which is good. Every mistake is my own. Jazakallah khair for listening. as
I think the first issue is that Muslims generally are not very scientifically literate, generally. And there's nothing wrong with being um, admitting faults that we actually have. So within the Muslim community, number one, when we do try to tackle this issue, we can't make heads or tails of it because we don't know what we're challenging or if we're supposed to challenge it or if it's in line with the Qur'an or if it's not in line with the Qur'an or what's actually going on. So it's kind of like walking into a dark room with a stick and you don't know what you're supposed to hit or if you're supposed to hit it. So that's the first issue. And that issue stems out of the fact that we don't actually understand what the Qur'an is saying, what the objective of the Qur'an is, and also the philosophy of science and what science can achieve and can't achieve, what the limits are, and what it can actually give in terms of working models. Okay. We spoke about ideas of knowledge and how we can appreciate and value different knowledge. How do we understand, is the knowledge just knowledge, right? Is there, uh, I think knowledge is a neutral, is it in a different vacuum? Can maybe expand on that point? Okay, good. So, yeah, good question. So, knowledge has been recently of the last, say, 60, 70 years, especially the last 100 or so years, been monopolized. Oh, like, it's, it's being monopolized. And how it's being monopolized is that if something is not scientifically measurable, if something is not observable, it's not there. If something cannot be empirically proven, it doesn't exist. And this is not only self-contradictory, this of course goes against all forms of logic. So ju just, just consider this. In the beginning of the sort of uh, 20th century, there was this movement amongst some extreme, philosoph uh, extreme philosophers who were extreme fans of uh, science. And that was the movement of logical positivism. positivism. So what their approach was this. If something cannot be empirically verified, it's, it's basically nonsense. If you cannot test it, we can't say it exists. Now this movement in philosophy uh, died simply because they realized the sentence, everything has to be empirically verified. That sentence can't be empirically verified. And also the fact that we have other sources of knowledge such as testimony, which is the main form of knowledge, and also reason and uh, mathematics and logic and whatnot. And all of these things can't be empirically verified, although they uh, give us the majority of the knowledge that we actually have. But somehow, through TV, through documentaries, through um, a whole array of uh, propaganda tools, we are being taught scientific rationalism from an extreme perspective. So just to give you an example, how many people here have seen the show The Big Bang Theory? Say a Anyway, so that show I watched simply to understand social engineering. And if you watch that show, it's very, very intelligent. You've got people who are supposed to be really, really smart, and the smartest of them, they don't believe in God. They're liberals. They're liberals in terms of their views on certain issues, and also that um, they. They, they like geeks and, you know, it's just cool to be what they are. And one of them, uh, what's his name again? What's his name? Sheldon. 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 <laughs> Sheldon, yeah? So, Sheldon goes to see his mom in Texas. Anyone saw that episode? You should have been watching that episode. Yeah, but, you know, I, I can tell there's a few faces that are guilty. So, there's, in that, in that basic episode, he goes to see his mom, and his mom, He's from Texas, and Texas is a Bible belt, right? It's in the Bible belt. So his mom is religious, and they show his mom as being like really stupid. And when he's having a conversation with his mom, then you know, she's like trying to push Christianity on him, and he's trying to tell her evolution's true, and she's the dumb one, he's the intelligent one. It's very clear what they're trying to do. And then what they were what they did is they made a spin-off for the Big Bang Theory, which was called Come on guys, don't be scared. Young Sheldon. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Abdullah has no idea. So, Young Sheldon was a spin-off from the Big Bang Theory. What was that about? That was the idea that you have this young kid who grows up in Texas. He's super intelligent, right? And the same thing about him, you know, him growing up and him being more intelligent than others. This isn't just 
the Big Bang Theory, you also have this in things like The Simpsons. In The Simpsons, you had uh, once somebody discovered that Homer actually had a uh, crayon stuck up his nose. So they decided to take it out and he became really intelligent. And when he became really intelligent as a person, what did he become? He became an atheist. And his neighbor, what's his name? The guy with the mustache. Flanders. Flanders. He's a practicing Christian and they always show him as in a very negative light as a dumb sort of person. He goes up to him and he says, here you go, here's proof that God doesn't exist. So this sort of, this sort of social engineering, this doesn't just happen in these mainstream programs. It starts at a elementary level. So my daughters, they watch um, Peter Rabbit. I don't know if you guys have that here. But Peter Rabbit is a famous kids show, right? It's the UK thing. Is it? Okay. It's the UK thing. Yeah, Peter Rabbit, Ben and Holly, you have these sort of things. So my daughters, they watch these programs. And in one of those programs, they are, the kids are investigating something. And one of the, one of the kids says to the other, there's no scientific proof for that. So, they, from a young age, they are indoctrinating them to think that science is the way, the truth, the life. And this is something which we have to unbrainwash ourselves. So, I know sometimes we have these discussions around topics like this. Um, I think the evolution is there. Uh, it's always framed in a way, is there a clash between science and theology? Right? Um, what's, the, what's the deal with that? The simple answer, is there a clash between science and Islam? The very simple answer is yes and no. Yes, if you don't understand science. Yes, if you think science gives you certainty. Yes, if you think scientific results are written in stone. No, if you understand the philosophy of science. No, if you understand the assumptions behind certain scientific theories. So if you have a proper understanding of the philosophy of science and what science can actually achieve, you would see that it's a root of knowledge which is good, which can give you certain results, but it's based on certain assumptions. And for example, one of the assumptions is um, methodological naturalism. Now that's a bit of a big word, but just consider this. What methodological naturalism says is when we look at the world, we are going to assume there's no soul, there's no uh, afterlife, there's no God, there's nothing working that's supernatural. That is an assumption. It's not a conclusion. Hence, when scientists are studying the body, they're never going to mention the soul because they assume there's no such thing. They're never going to mention design because they believe there's no such thing because of the assumption of naturalism. So just to give you an example, uh, Francis Crick. Anyone heard of Francis Crick? A few people. Okay. What was he known for? He won the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of DNA. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize along with Watson for that. And he was a famous evolutionary biologist and an atheist, and here's what he said. Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was evol evolved, it was not designed. So, axiomatically, prior to even looking at the evidence, the assumption is nothing in nature is designed. Everything has a naturalistic explanation. So when people look at science and they look at the fact that scientists never mention God, they shouldn't think scientists are somehow evil people or something. They should understand the philosophy of science is such that there's no soul, there's no God, there's no design. And also this is why human beings, they cannot accept a scientist appeared in the history of life without being linked to something else. You can't just say human beings appeared in the history of life at this certain point without human beings being linked to some other form of life. Because of the belief in methodological naturalism, hence why you have people like Gareth Nelson, who's a mainstream evolutionary biologist, he's not religious in any perspective, in any way, nor is he someone who denies Darwinian evolution. He says, human being, uh, sorry, no, he says, we must have some ancestors, we'll pick those, why? Because they must be there, and these are the best candidates. He's talking about fossils. So he's saying, look, Axiomatically, human beings must have common ancestors because that's the only conclusion that we can come to. So these look like the best candidates, therefore they're there. So what people don't realize is when there's a certain fossil that evolutionary biologists actually give, that fossil which is claimed to be an ancestor, they're just told, we're just told, look, that fossil is your grandma or 
was Lucy, was this or that. But that fossil is based on four assumptions. The first assumption is the assumption of methodological naturalism, which is human beings must have some ancestors, so let's look for them. The assumption number two is the assumption that similarities are due to common descent, which assumption can be challenged by Homo Plasi, that their similarities are not due to common descent. The third assumption is the assumption of uh, natural selection being the mechanism which leads this to that. But like I mentioned previously, that mechanism is something which is openly challenged by some biologists. The fourth assumption is there's only one origin of life. What's interesting, why do they postulate only one origin of life? Because life is extremely complex. And in the words of Richard Dawkins in the book The God Delusion, he says, the first beginning of life is the only luck that we need. After that, we can, we can theoretically explain everything else. That's why they postulate one origin of life. And it's an assumption, it's not a conclusion. The assumption that there's one origin of life is not based on, we've got all this data, so there must be one origin of life. No, it's the assumption. And the assumption is based on the idea of methodological naturalism. Now some of you here, mashallah, you know, you're going to understand this straight away. Some of you, this may be new content, you may not know a bit of philosophy of science, a bit of um, uh, science. But all I want you to remember is the public perception is totally different to the academic understanding. And that gap is not accidental. It's not accidental that people are taught it's a, it's a fact when it's not. That's due to people like Julian Huxley, who I mentioned previously. It's a deliberate attempt to indoctrinate people into their philosophy. We've got two more questions, and I know we're running short of time, so I'll get to the first one. But um, uh, maybe sort of time wrap this up. Now, uh, from the question, from the question that I'm receiving, there seems to be one uh, misunderstanding: is that okay? Understanding science, philosophy of science, and evolution is more than just science itself. But then what about the scientific miracles of the Quran? Um, uh, there's one particular brother or sister, mashallah, and I think we've got about seven or eight messages, um, asking uh, to, to distinguish between those two. So we have scientific miracles, but then we're not anti-science, and then we're, you know, how do we navigate that? If that makes sense. Okay, this is very, very important. When we as Muslims, our job is to project Islam. We cannot project Islam if we don't understand it in the first place. What we do is we sometimes adopt things without understanding them. Like myself, I used to believe in scientific miracles in the Quran and I used to use that in Dawah conversations. Only later did I discover nobody in the history of Islam used scientific miracles and this is a recent innovation. It is actually an innovation. In fact, this is not something which is unheard of by so this is something which is unheard of, but the scholars of Islam have openly challenged the du'at who claim they are scientific miracles in the Qur'an. So for example, going back decades, we're speaking about uh, people like Shaykh uh, bin Baz, speaking about Shaykh uh, Salih al-Fawzan, they have said that this scientific miracle stuff is not correct. Why is it not correct? Because the, the, the proponents of this are taking the Qur'an and they're taking science, and they're saying, the science says this, and the Qur'an says this, they match, therefore the Qur'an's a miracle. There's two problems here. Number one, the science that they're pinpointing at, how do they know that that science is not going to change? Two, the science that they claim is in the Qur'an, is that based on the understanding of the Muslims throughout the generations, or is that understanding a new understanding? So for example, how many people have heard that the universe is expanding and the Quran says the universe is expanding. Raise your hands. Okay. Go to the classical tafsir of the Quran. You will find multiple meanings of that verse. The vast majority of tafsir, they say the universe is vast. It doesn't say the universe is expanding. One tafsir says it's expanding. So according to that, there's two meanings. The universe is vast or the universe is, is expanding. You've already taken the power out of that argument if the universe is expanding. Second, how many people have heard the Big Bang is in the Quran? Okay. 
How many models of the Big Bang are there? At least 17. On top of that, there are physicists today who are challenging the Big Bang model and going back to a different model. So if we say the Big Bang is in the Quran, in 20 years time, somebody is going to come along and change, the science change a little bit uh, after a few decades, they're going to ch change the Big Bang with another model and the Quran is going to look outdated. So we're unnecessarily putting the Quran at risk, even though that wasn't the message of the Quran. And here's the thing, people want to believe in miracles, right? So if someone wants to convey Islam, the first thing they do is look for miracles, look for miracles, look for miracles. If you want to follow miracles, there's one man that you should follow. That's the job, because he's going to give you miracles. He's going to command the sky to rain and it's going to rain. He's going to command the dead to come to rise, they're going to come to rise. We don't believe the Quran is the truth because of miracles. We believe the Quran is the truth because the Quran gives a message of God which is in line with our nature, the fitrah, and which is in line with our intellect. The fact that there's one God, He's the only one worthy of worship and there's nothing like Him. That's why the Quran is the truth. The Prophet didn't give, a, didn't give a miracle to Khatija radiallahu anhu. He didn't give a miracle to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He gave them the pristine message of Islam and they accepted it straight away. The miracles came afterwards. We believe the Quran is the truth primarily because of Tawheed and then we have supplementary miracles. If you just want to go with miracles without the Quran, then we would just follow the Jal. In fact, you would not even wait for the Jal. You can follow uh, Pentecostal Christianity. Because I'm telling you, some of those guys and, and the female priestesses, or whatever they're called, they can do amazing stuff. They can tell you information about you that only you know. So if you want to follow miracles, you can end up following those people. As Muslims, we first look at the message. Is the message a message of Tawheed? The message that is in line with our, keep doing this with, in line with our concept of God. Yes, it does. Now, it has miracles. Okay, now we accept it to be true. We don't just purely go by miracles. And this idea of going with scientific miracles, this is a reaction to an inferiority complex we have because the West is far ahead of us in, 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 in terms of science. Muslims contribute almost nothing to the scientific advancement. And obviously this is in terms, you know, the West goes uh, in front in terms of science and maybe the Chinese will go and this is just the way of the world. Because we don't have anything to contribute, we start saying our book has these miracles. But that's a really, uh, a really uh, defeatist approach. So we'll wrap it up there. I've got one last question. And a really, really quick, a quick answer. So is evolution a fact? Yes and no. Okay, and for more information on that, come to the Monash University Islamic Society event tomorrow at 6.30 Clayton Campus. Um, there's a specific interactive... Um